In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank God we are here today. And I know you are at the other end of the line. We prepared, we dressed up for church, we fasted today as much as we could. And we're here today, partaking all of us at the same time of the Word of God and of this humble homily that I'd like to offer to you. We do so often. In fact, we have done so every day of these last two weeks as we gather, the few of us from our community and from others, online every morning from 11 a.m. to pray together, to hear the Word of God, to give us strength, to orient us, to bring us together, and to lead us on the path of salvation. In one of these meetings, reflections were offered and somebody mentioned about the current crisis of the coronavirus as being a miracle. This is something that puts us through the desert, so to say. It deprives us of many things because for many jobs have withered, traveling has withered. Outside entertainment in theaters has withered. Eating out has withered. Greeting friends and spending time in fellowship has withered. For many Orthodox Christians around the world, participating in divine services in the church where they were baptized maybe, in their village or city, has withered. And for many of us, receiving Holy Communion has withered. It is a desert that comes to us, though, as a miracle. A desert that we're being forced to go through. God's hand upon us. Involuntarily. We did not ask for this directly. I think we asked for it indirectly in the way we lived our lives for many generations. But it's an involuntary approach of this desert that has withered many aspects of our life. And it only becomes a miracle and not a pain and suffering to those who are able to go through another desert, the one that they willingly pick up. It is a miracle because it shapes humanity and our very creation at a large scale. But it becomes a miracle to us again when we have the ability to see it, to feel it as a miracle. And this can only happen if we cross the desert of our own willingly. Today, the church around the world celebrates our Holy Mother Mary of Egypt whose life we heard, read in the churches this last Thursday. And we tremble in awe at the love and power of God to forgive sins and sinners, no matter how bad one might have sinned, like the Virgin, like the, the Mary, Mary of Egypt. Briefly, we learned about her, that when she was 12 years of age, she began a life of debauchery, of enjoying herself in an extreme way through sexual pleasures. And for 17 years, he gave her body abusively without rest to many men. She herself tells Zosima, who discovered her in the desert towards the end of her life, how she became an instrument of the devil, fishing young men in particular and throwing them into hell because of their fornication. Through her sin, although today, to many, might, might not seem something extraordinary because we read and see about this everywhere. You just have to go to a university campus. And today we have much worse sinful behaviors, abusive to the body and to the soul than this. But she's a symbol of a fallen human being. She too faced a desert. But what kind of desert did she face the one of kind that I said is in, involuntary, <clears throat> without desiring it? Because she had everything she wanted. 
She had sex plentifully. She had food from these men who were buying her food and wine. She had the music that she wanted to hear enticing her to sin even more. It just sounds like she had the whole internet at her hand. She did have all those. But Mary was in a very harsh drought, in a desert without knowing it. Mary, from Egypt, was taken to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, by God's will, allowing her to be even more defiled and polluted on the boat by the sailors. And lo and behold, she made it to the church where the Holy Cross relics were to be elevated on the Feast of the Holy Cross. And without knowing it, she was taken by the people wave to go into the church. And as we learn in her life, an invisible force stopped her and her only alone from entering the church, the holy space, the house of God, to venerate the holy relics. This is a great moment in her life, and it should be in ours as well. Because when St. Mary tried the second time to enter, she failed. And the third time, she failed too. She said, it was, less, it was like God, I think God was seeking my repentance. Indeed. God was seeking her to see the desert that she was in. Mary was blind. She couldn't see the drought because she was covered in sin day and night. And only when with great difficulty it began to dawn on me, the ver- St. Mary says, I began to understand the reason why I was prevented from being admitted to see the life-giving cross. The word of salvation gently touched the eyes of my heart and revealed to me that it was my unclean life which bared the entrance to me. I began to weep and lament and beat my breast and to sigh from the depths of my heart. And so I stood weeping when I saw above me the icon of the Most Holy Mother of God, the Virgin Mary. It is this moment of awakening. Some say when dealing with addictions of hitting rock bottom. It is this moment that we all long for. That God will see us, will grant us to see the drought of our separation from Him. Oh, how dry our homes are. Oh, how dry our world is. And what a great miracle this is that God is pouring His love upon us. Yes, it is a miracle because we are turning to Him. And many of us realizing the need to bring the tears upon the desert of the hearts and then allow them to bring fruit. So Mary, the sinful woman, realized that her uncleanness, her way of life, her behaviors, her job, her way of eating, her relationships, the way she traveled, were all defying God. And she woke up. And the sign that she woke up is that she wept and lamented. God grant us this. God grant us to see this miracle when we weep and lament. Grant us these tears. And she stood weeping when I saw above the icon of the Most Pure Holy Mother. Do you see the icon of the Virgin Mary right behind me? I hope you have one right next to your iPad or or phone right now. And Mary, turning to her, continues, says, My bodily and spiritual eyes, and turning to her, my bodily and spiritual eyes, I said, O Lady, Mother of God, who gave birth in the flesh to God the Word. I know, how well I know, that it is no honor or praise to you when one is so impure and depraved as I look up to your icon, O ever Virgin Mary, who kept your body and soul in purity. Rightly do I inspire hatred and disgust before your virginal purity. But I have heard 
that God who was, who was born of you became man on purpose to call sinners to repentance. Then help me, for I have no other help. Order the entrance of the church to be open to me. Allow me to see the venerable tree on which he who was born of you suffered in the flesh and on which he shed his, his holy blood for the redemption of sinners and for me, unworthy as I am. Be my faithful witness before your Son that I will never again defile my body by the impurity of fornication. But as soon as I have seen the tree of the cross, I will renounce the world and its temptations and will go wherever you will lead me. The tears of repentance led Mary, the sinful woman, to a dialogue and intense prayer to the Virgin Mary. Mary facing Mary. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine this? We have them both side by side right here in our icons. And not only does she repent from the depth of her heart, but she begs the Virgin Mary for her help, as we should all do these days. Help me. Allow the doors to be unlocked for me, the barrier to be lifted. But this comes along with her repentance and asking her to intercede by her son. But along with her repentance, we see here the promise to change. Let us not forget that every confession we do in church, in front of the icon of God, of Christ, as we hear the forgiveness words, prayers of the priest and the cross touching our head, we feel that there must be a a decisive decision for us to change, to renounce what was sinful. As we hear these words today, if we do shed a tear in the divine liturgy, thanking God, praying to the Virgin Mary, there should be a word coming from the heart with a decision to renounce what's sinful, what's impure in our lives. So Mary, the sinful woman, did. And the Virgin Mary helped her, of course. She was allowed to enter. Her repentance was pleasing to God and her sacrifice was accepted. And the Virgin Mary now directs her to change her life. Now that she could see and and, and realize what desert she had been in, away from God, although enjoying life, now she's asked to follow her promise. The Virgin Mary leads her after she calls on her to be led by the hand on the path of repentance. And the Virgin tells her, if you cross the Jordan, you will find glorious rest. She's given three coins. She buys three breads. She continues. Her, she begins her journey to cross the River Jordan. She gets washed in the River Jordan as a way of being baptized, if you wish. She received the holy gifts at the church of St. John the Baptist, and here she is in the desert, willingly, willingly. So not only did she wake up, realize what what desert she was in, unwillingly, away from God. Not only did she repent, not only did she ask for help, not only was she told what to do, but she's obedient, and God continues to be with her again, confirming that He will not abandon her. She begins now, the journey in the physical desert, in the desert of her heart, willingly. For 37 years, we find her there, working on herself. 17 years of sinfulness were mirrored now in the desert, willingly by 17 years of fighting her passions. The lust of her body, the memories of her sexual pleasures, the memory of the taste of wine, the memory of the music she was hearing were all demons torturing her. And for days and nights, beating herself, taking, trying to take control over her body in the spirit, laying down on the ground unmoved to fight these demons. With courage, with great courage, 37 years. After 17 years, the Lord God allowed these demons to be kicked away from her, and she found indeed that peace. Seventeen years. We might find ourselves now tired of being locked in for two or three weeks. 
It might be two or three months. It might be a year. God knows. This is the involuntary desert that is given to us. But we learn from the Virgin Mary and her experience how to transform this disaster, calamity, epidemic into a glorious moment of our life to make it a miracle. And the key to this is to change the involuntary desert into the voluntary desert. Just like St. Mary of Egypt did. Willingly make the resolution to repent and work on this. Work on our sinfulness and fight it. And I know it is so much harder these days when we stay in the house with the computers turned on and the televisions maybe 24 hours a day. Okay, 16. Some of you might go to bed at night. What great temptations do we face? Of despondency, of finding ourselves talking to friends, spending endless times on the internet thinking that we do them good, perhaps serving others, entrenching ourselves in work, raising funds for who knows what organizations to help the pets or who knows what, humanitarian purposes. And we forget that these will pull us into that despondency that we too talked about in the class that takes us away from what's necessary. Our repentance, our ascetic life of prayer, of fasting, on a continuous presence and stance in front of God. So, brothers and sisters, this is what the church brings to us today. That is the Orthodox Church. I'd like you to see how Orthodox this is. The ver- I'm sorry, Mary, the sinful woman going to venerate the Holy Cross, Orthodox. People rushing in to venerate the cross, Orthodox. Going in the desert, the monks from there for 40 days from that monastery during the fast without food, Orthodox ascetical life. Today, bringing to life, centuries later, St. Mary of Egypt, how Orthodox this is. Asking for her intercessions. Holy Mother Mary, pray for us. Welcome to the Orthodox Church. The beautiful canons we heard from the Triodion. The abundant scriptural presence in our services. How rich this is. So we turn to those in the desert of our hearts voluntarily. Allow me to close with a few words about the desert. Because many people, especially in the 3rd and 4th century, rushed to the desert in Egypt and the Holy Land. For them... Those teachers of the desert, we learn that the desert is a place, should be, a place of spiritual revolution, not a personal retreat. A place of spiritual revolution, not a spiritual retreat. In other words, a personal retreat, forgive me. As we go through the involuntary desert of the coronavirus, let that not become a personal retreat in our homes. A vacation, a break, an entertaining time. We will not see this as a miracle. But we change this personal retreat temptation voluntarily into a spiritual revolution, which means change, spiritual change. In other words, be Orthodox Christian, as Father Barnabas says, on purpose. Number two, the desert brings us separated from people and not living with with people is hard we call on separation from people at times to have quietness and we don't do this to live without people we do this to live with God for God this is a replacement of relationships we must dedicate this time of our day live for God And finally, the desert is not a place alone. We know of deserts in this country. But it could be anywhere, in our homes, in our jobs, in our church. Because for us to go in our inner desert, it is a way, a way of life, a way of spiritual life. So, we can do it everywhere. But now, let us pay attention. We do not have to go to the desert desert 
physically like St. Mary of Egypt did. But we have to go, we must go through the desert. We must go through the desert. It is a necessary step, brothers and sisters. The involuntary desert, and much more so needed, the voluntary desert. is part of our spiritual journey. The pain, the suffering, the emptiness, the breakdowns, the crisis in the families, our deaths, involuntary desert. They bring overwhelming, the crushing of the heart. The voluntary desert, however, brings constructive relationship with God and liberation from the struggles. In this struggle, entering our own heart, facing the desert, we're enabled to see, as St. Mary of Egypt did, understand, as she did, and embrace our limitation and failures. Are we willing to sign up for this, to change the struggle, the curse of this coronavirus into a blessing? Absolutely. But here's the wisdom of the church. This is being done around us, around you, at least now for five weeks. This is what the Great and Holy Lent is about. This is why last Thursday we chanted the can of St. Andrew, can of repentance, to see, understand, and embrace our failures and limitations. This is why we are here today, to receive God's love and His mercy and come together as a community with a lot more power. As we were praying and reading and reflecting together this last week, as I said, in our classes, we also talked about the book we are reading now by St. Porphyrios. It's called Wounded by Love. And St. Porphyrios tells us about how he was pulled, rather, involuntarily into a desert that he didn't like. Finally, after a long journey and praying to God, he is appointed to be the chaplain at the hospital in Athens. It was his dream. It was his calling. And he had just only begun, begun there, just started. He had to serve the divine liturgy every day. And shortly after this, a great temptation hit him. Outside of his chapel's windows, across the street, there was a merchant, a shop, who was selling gramophones. Parents, you might have to tell your children what gramophones are. It's just like loud music devices. And he was advertising his, his uh, gramophones every day, very loudly. And St. Porfirios couldn't pray. Couldn't celebrate the Divine Liturgy pre being present there. And he was ready to leave. He wanted to throw the towel and go to a different place in defeat. So he prayed to God. He prayed, really prayed hard. Show me, God, what I should do because this is too much for me. He fasted for three days. He prayed intensely. And he said, show me in a simple way so I can see it. And God did. He was approached by a child with a textbook from a physics class, probably, if I remember correctly, who had some questions to him, presenting to him an experiment, and he had to comment on that. The experiment had to do with throwing rocks in the water. And this is what St. Porfirios read out of this. If a small rock is thrown in the water, the water is disturbed, and waves are formed on the water. When a bigger rock is thrown nearby, this bigger rock makes bigger waves, and the small ones are overtaken, not even visible, by the bigger waves produced by the big rock. St. Porfirios went back to his chapel, thanking God with tears for the lesson. What lesson? Stay focused on Christ. Stay focused on the prayers, on the holy gifts, on the service. Make that the bigger rock. And the neighbor next door with the gramophone, the small rock, will be covered. So he did. And from that day on, he served the liturgy with the angels. 
So we too, brothers and sisters. So we too. The involuntary deserts are affecting us. This one we're crossing together. But make it the small rock. Bring yourselves, the Saint Mary of Egypt did, by the icon of the Virgin Mary. And with tears, ask for her to help. So we could see, so you could see, so we could all see the brokenness in our heart and repent and change going, rushing to our inner desert to purify our hearts by God's grace whose love is for us to forgive, embrace and restore. May His name be glorified unto the ages of ages. Amen.